This is a Weather Audio Broadcast Network and Hurricane City monthly special of the Barometer Bob Show. If you would like to talk about any weather subject during the show, give Barometer Bob a call anywhere nationwide and from the Caribbean on our toll-free number at 888-372-8890. Or you can email Bob at barometerbob at yahoo.com. Good evening, everybody. This is Barometer Bob Brookins for the November 12, 2000 Hurricane Center with the Hollywood um, Amateur Radio Group. Ah, okay. And that was in November 95. We came down and guys gave us a nice tour down there. The, the facilities. But, but, you know, hold on, Bob. You were around for uh, Floyd, though, right? Weren't you the director when Hurricane Floyd was about? Oh, yes, yes. I was there through the 99 season, but Bob just means he was he was into the, the Hurricane Center. He hasn't been there since then. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. So we um, we were discussing, I just wanted to, being you're in California, get your feedback on the, uh, on about the thinning of the forest out there. Well, uh, personally, I'd like to see it done, but uh, I realize there are there are people that feel like uh, the forest should be left uh, natural, and uh, I think that's great uh, until we start building homes close to them. And and now you're putting people's lives at danger, in danger, and uh, I think that that's probably not a good idea. But thinning the forest makes sense to me. I live here in northeast Florida, and in 1998, we had the forest fires here. And the forestry division here in the state of Florida has done a wonderful job keeping the underbrush, cleaning out the dead trees. And so I'm wondering if possibly that is in some way that they could work something out there in Southern California. That's basically what I was um, covering at the beginning of the show, forest fires and now. They're getting rain, some rainfall and some snow levels at 6,000 feet above. And possibility for some mudslides could occur from these rains. Um, same areas in the San Bernardino Mountain were receiving rain where these fires occurred. So that's where I was starting the show off. But now that you're here, I guess we can talk tropics. Hey, let's talk tropics. <laughs> So um, we have this uh, area out in the, well, basically over uh, Puerto Rico and in the northeastern Caribbean extending into the Atlantic. Um, what are your thoughts about that this evening? Well, the, the presence of land there uh, makes it uh, a little harder for it to develop. And uh, uh, it may develop. If it does, it's probably going to move across the Puerto Rico or the Dominican Republic, one of the two, and uh, end up on the north side. I guess there's a slight threat to the Bahamas, but uh, uh, really not much. Uh, I think it'll probably just go toward the northeast there, and uh, probably other than the cause of the heavy rains down there, probably not going to amount to much. Right, and you know, and I mentioned that also. Um, there was a number of areas that I covered during my show and that they're under flash flood warnings and flood warnings. Uh, watches the entire island and some of the smaller islands in the Virgin Islands. Um, and that's about what I figured that they would be getting this constant um, series of heavy rain. So uh, we have some listeners down there in Puerto Rico that are regular listeners, and I know we can get an 800 call from the Caribbean. Am I correct, Jim? Uh, we should be if we uh, don't get much feedback. I thought we had that solved, but I right, guess we yeah, didn't. We did have that problem. We're still trying to work out our uh, the toll-free number there that Jim has. Get a lot of um, feedback from that. But Jerry, I, uh, go ahead, Bob. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, you, you still keep real close track of the tropics? Uh, I do because I work with uh, a, a group there in the Keys that provide the services to industry. And uh, so I, I try to keep track of it uh, because of them. And uh, from time to time, I, I uh, uh, call folks that, that are working for them, that are 
you know, that they've contracted with and uh, give them briefings and so forth. So I have to keep pre pretty uh, much on top of it. Do you miss being the director? Uh, I'm asked that uh, question pretty often, and uh, uh, it was fun, but the uh, bureaucracy is just maddening. It is just outrageous. I don't know how Max puts up with it, uh, and it's getting worse. Um, can you enlighten us just a little bit on that? I mean, just uh, not to get in fully into detail, but uh, give me an example of what, why it when you say bureaucracy, uh, a typical example of uh, what would drive you crazy. Oh, uh, you're always fighting off budget cuts. Uh, one of the things that uh, looks to the, the rest of NOAA, uh, it looks like that we're, uh, the Hurricane Center is not, uh, man it's not manned like the rest of NOAA. And the reason it isn't is that you, you need specialists to do that job. And you have specialists, and so they say, well, what do they do the rest of the year? Well, the truth is, they're probably as busy the rest of the year as they are during the hurricane season. And But you're continually having to fend off that, uh, that sort of attack. And uh, the other thing is that, uh, that Washington knows best. And, and I'm not picking on this administration. In fact, most of my experience was with the previous administration. But... Uh, uh, if you 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 can't speak up, you're you know as a civil servant, you can't uh, when when they're doing something wrong that that endangers the service, you can't speak about it. So you have to go out and get somebody else to speak for you. And uh, those sorts of things just drive you crazy. The 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 uh, the budgets are always tight, and uh, uh, you know we don't we don't want to see waste. But the the hurricane center is one of the most frugal places in the world. And you're being judged by people that uh, that waste money, so um, it's uh, it's the kind of thing we don't need. I, I think the uh, there is the kind of thing I don't need. Uh, I can do without it. Oh, that's a shame. Um, was it, oh, uh, the Floyd. When you were tracking Hurricane Floyd, I know that that was a huge, huge event. Um, when it was a category border, borderline category five, when it was in the uh, Bahamas, right. and uh, at that point, the uh, whole southeastern United States was in panic mode. Um, give us a little idea what that was like tracking that hurricane. Well, it, for the most part, what we were looking at were, were forecast models that we had confidence in that were telling us it was not going to hit the southeast coast. The, the southern part of the Florida Peninsula at least, but it was probably going to hit up farther north somewhere. And uh, so we, we had, uh, uh, you don't want to put out a warning for uh, North Carolina and Georgia four days ahead, but once you start putting up warnings for some part of Florida, then everybody sees the handwriting on the wall and people begin to respond and things begin to go wrong up the coast and uh, uh, they begin to go wrong in the uh, evacuation process. Uh, there were some roads up there that uh, that they had, uh, I'm doing this from memory and I may not have all the facts right, but as I recall there were some roads that uh, they intended to reverse the direction on. I believe it was Interstate 26, but I'm not sure. And I think that didn't work very well. And uh, it turned out they pulled off one of the biggest evacuations ever, and uh, the storm went by them, and they really didn't get much there where they got the problem for on up in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. yeah, that but, was uh, uh, there was uh, a fair amount of pressure. I think uh, the, the nice thing, when, when South Florida is not on the spot, then that uh, the pressure inside the building there is not quite so bad and uh, it's uh, I don't want to tell you that we treat South Florida different we try not to but the truth is the pressure uh, is different when your neighbors are being threatened and uh, uh, they're calling <laughs> and, uh, and the, all of the, the, the local TVs stations are camping in there, <laughs> and definitely the, the pressure is different than it is when it's on up the coast. 
And uh, so I think that was one of the things that made it a little more manageable. Mm -hmm. hmm. Uh, Bob, got any questions? I lived here in, uh, again, northeast Florida when uh, Floyd came, came by, and it was pretty much a controlled atmosphere of mass hysteria. Um, <laughs> I think that's about right. I, I live 52 miles from the coast, and some people were like, oh, well, if it hits, it hits, and here these are people, some of these people are living in mobile homes. I've spent the last few years here working with National Weather Service Jacksonville and my local EOC storm spotter classes and hurricane seminars and, and the like, and trying to educate the people more on the weather. And it, it's amazing that Floyd, you would think that hurricane as large as Floyd was, that some people wouldn't... Um, wouldn't think to be to be better prepared that the possibility is there for a hurricane to strike North Florida. But as they say, they never hit here. They always turn and hit up in the Carolinas. Um, well, Floyd, I had I was in a my personal situation. I had to evacuate because my wife was injured and slipped just a couple days before that. And Dislocated her kneecap, and as it was about 18, 24 hours before it got due east of Jacksonville, National Hurricane Center still had the center passing just west of Jacksonville. Am I correct on the official? Uh, that sounds right. I, I don't have the specific. Right, and that was the official forecast. And you know, I'm looking at, I'm watching this on the internet. I look at my wife sitting over there all bundled up in a leg cast and I says, hey, we've got to uh, start packing up because we're going to have to evacuate. It was, it was a mess. Um, I-10 for miles and, you know, I took US-90 westbound. I didn't even bother with I-10. I got as far west as Perry, which is well west of Tallahassee, almost uh, well west of Lake City, almost Tallahassee. The Interstate 10 was still bumper to bumper. And it, it's... But I, I think the, cons the consensus was that South Florida was never really a high risk. Uh, is, is it true that the forecasters were kind of figuring that this was not a South Florida storm even when it was approaching the uh, Bahamas? Yeah, we pretty much always thought it would come close, but turn. And uh, uh, right Pass down to the off. end, and I think we Pass finally off. did put up a warning, but it was uh, uh, just because we thought it was too close, and uh, it still hadn't turned, and that uh, we could, if we were wrong, we'd get a lot of people killed. So we we thought we'd better go ahead and put the warning up, and uh, right. almost as soon as we got it up, it began to show signs that it was turning. That was a great job. That was a great job, by the way. You guys, uh, you did predict that turn, and I know there was a lot of tension in the media and a lot of talk out there as the turn was not taking place. And then finally it turned, and uh, it reminds me of Hurricane Michelle also uh, that uh, in 2000, I believe that was, or 2001, where Michelle was heading towards South Florida, and then it made that right-hand turn. Uh, just great forecasting and you guys are always under bombardment from the media and uh, the internet and everywhere else about how close you know whether you should or shouldn't put warnings out but your forecast tracks have been pretty good the last uh, several years have been really really good well since i left they've been good <laughs> nothing were good even when you were there i, I believe, believe me i uh, i've been keeping track of these things since i was a teenager in the 70s and uh, uh the last uh, since you've been in there and and uh it, it's just the forecasting keeps getting better and better, and uh, I don't know if you had anything to do about that. But I'll tell you, a lot of that was done by uh, modelers out there that nobody ever hears about, but uh, that have have done a lot of good development work. Maybe that's something we ought to talk about sometime. That there is virtually no money being spent in this country on hurricane forecasting. If you look, at, if you compare earthquakes to hurricanes. The uh, amount of damage done by hurricanes is about ten times that done by earthquakes in mm -hmm. this country. Yep. The amount of casualties is about ten times. 
But the spending is about 10 times as much on earthquakes as it is hurricanes. Why this is, probably it, it is our own fault. We probably uh, have been too successful, and we've probably not been very good politicians. But uh, uh, there's something lopsided about the way that, uh, that we're looking at our natural disasters. And uh, I don't know what it, what it is. Maybe uh, earthquakes are more scary. Yeah, or maybe you... it's that they're basically a one-state phenomena. But you would think that would go the other way. You, would you, know, you, know, what, you know what I think it is? I, I, it's just my opinion. I think that when Andrew hit, as much damage as it did, the fatalities were relatively low. And I think that their thinking is that if an earthquake, major earthquake, although if you look at the Oakland earthquake that was right around the same time as Hurricane Andrew, uh, it killed about the same amount of people. But I think it was they... 89, uh, yeah. So it was close, close to Hugo. It was within about a month of Hugo. Yeah, r right, right. And uh, it, I remember the, the death toll was not... Uh, I don't think it reached over 100, did it? No, I'm thinking it was about 50 or 60, which was... Uh, much more than Andrew, although if you count the same way, it probably was about the same because it, we count those that are directly killed by the hurricane. So if you don't, if you're not killed that day, now you may be wounded and die later, and we'll, we'd still count you. But if you're if you're if you're killed when as the hurricane goes by, or you're wounded so that you die because the hurricane went by, we count you. If you are killed when you're uh, by a heart attack or a chainsaw and recovering, we don't count you. That's, mm -hmm. that's different. The earthquake people count, count them all. And mm -hmm. they count damages. Uh, they count loss of business and all that stuff. We only count direct damage. So it's a, it's an entirely different way. And I think that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, even despite that, despite that difference in the way of counting, those 10 to 1 numbers I told you about still are pretty much true. Now, they're not exactly 10.0, but they're in that ballpark. Uh, uh, but uh, even when you, you do what I consider to be a different kind of counting, and there's nothing wrong with it, it's just that, that it's, it's not standardized, uh, those, uh, the difference is still out there. Hmm. And I don't, have a good, I don't have a good explanation for it. Well, there are some changes that need to be made. It's like... Um, I was at a storm spotter class last week, and a nickel, hail the size of a nickel can be consist, is considered for, to be reported as, as severe weather, but hail the size of a dime isn't. So, like this person said, somebody in an office in Washington made this decision. So here you could have the downburst and the same damaging winds with hail the size of a dime, where you would, you know, also with hail the size of a nickel, but it's not considered severe weather. So um, it, there are changes that have to be made, and I think in time some of these changes as to damage and everything, over time these changes will be made, especially when... God forbid, when something big like a Floyd um, makes landfall in Florida or, you know, in a, in a populated area. And it's been fairly lucky since yep. Andrew. New York City. Well, a, a hit on New York City, something like that would get their attention. You know, it, it's amazing to think of it. I, I looked back at this a few years ago. We have not had a major hurricane hit a major population center since 1965, and I say that, that Andrew did not hit a major population center. It went in south of, of the, the real population center. It didn't hit a major city. It missed Miami. It went in south. You know, right. Count Holmes had a major city. Right. Uh, New Orleans in 1965, and, and New Orleans in 1965 is nothing like New Orleans now. But, uh, it, and Charleston is not a major city, and, and Hugo didn't hit Charleston either. <laughs> it right. went in north of Charleston. But, but it's amazing that we have not had uh, a, a major hurricane make a direct hit on a major city since 1965. And uh, we don't know what, uh, what hurricanes will do to high-rise buildings. We haven't 
how to test it. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that, that we don't know about that uh, are waiting to, or, or lessons waiting to be learned one of these days. Have you seen that movie, Condominium? No. It's about a uh, hurricane. Um, it, it's a movie based on a hurricane hitting the northern Gulf Coast and the uh, uh, panhandle, I believe it is, and a condominium collapses during the hurricane. And it was a made-for-TV movie. I think it was made in the 70s. And the, the movie uh, has the, the uh, condominium just completely collapsing. Mm -hmm. And a big, big uh, you know, 12 to 15-story high building just collapses uh, because it's not piled properly. There's not enough pilings uh, going deep enough to hold the building up. Do you think that that's possible, that we could see one of these big, tall condos collapse into the ocean in a, in a major hurricane? If you've ever seen the Neil Frank presentation... He shows these things where, where pilings come out from under buildings. And uh, I think it's just a matter of, uh, and not all buildings are that way, but some are. And it's just a matter of, uh, of uh, find, find the, the hurricane finding the poorly constructed building. And I don't care how tall they are, they can be poorly constructed. Because if, if you had... Bad engineers, or, uh, or uh, either incompetent or dishonest, uh, that can happen. And uh, I think it probably will happen sometime, but uh, uh, hopefully not in That's my life. That's a scary thought. And you got a lot of seniors that refuse to leave those buildings. Yeah, in fact, I, I heard about the, uh, there, I think it was Andrew, that people wouldn't leave their condominiums there in the Fort Lauderdale area. And if you remember, the uh, hurricane was hit and was, the forecast was for it to go in north of Miami instead of south of Miami, and uh, <clears throat> they would have been in trouble. Now, I lived in Hollywood when Andrew came in down there. And, uh, at first, it was slated, it was beelining for the Dade Broward County line right there, 215th Street, and... Um, that was that would have been the worst case scenario because of the residential communities through that whole area there. Um, I think Hollywood, I believe, is the largest population in Broward County, and would have been directly affected by it if, if it had come in there. Yeah, I think Bob, I'll be right there. Bob, I'll be right back. I got an issue here. Okay. Um, real quick, if you could hold on just a moment, Jerry. There was I'm um, running a weather software program that brings in the re, um, okay. warnings and everything from the National Weather Service. Uh -huh. There was a severe thunderstorm warning issued for Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania at 8.34 p.m. Folks there in um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, if you have um, your NOAA weather radio, I suggest you turn it on and get your update from your local National Weather Service. Um, they're having a lot of really bad weather up through the Midwest then uh, I just reloaded the weather node program. A lot of the EOCs use this and we uh, give whatever information we can during the show to whatever listeners. have listeners in Perrine, down in South Florida, Tallahassee, Pittsburgh, and in New Jersey. Um, we, did, we did plan to have a giveaway this evening, Jerry, to to a caller to call in, but I haven't received it yet, and I, I don't like to give away if and Do not have the, uh, the the item. Yeah, yeah, I, I can I, see people might get irritated about. It. <laughs> yeah, I'll give them a Hurricane City T-shirt if they, you know, that doesn't come in. If, if you want to do that, um, matter of fact, we had a question from David in Orlando through Storm Chat here through the website. Um, uh, Hurricane Hunter went out today and found weak winds. So he's asking, does that mean anything? And second, in your opinion, would it become a tropical depression or a weak tropical storm? The area down in the northeast, eastern Caribbean. That wouldn't last too long, even if it did, maybe 12.4 hours tops, according to what the forecast models are showing. Um, Cut an email here for Jerry. Um, would like, would you please tell Mr. Gerald 
that if no one thanked him lately for the hard work he did while he was at the National Hurricane Center, that we certainly do now. It's also great to hear him still in there kicking, and that's uh, from Diane in Fort Lauderdale. Well, I appreciate it, Diane. Uh, lots of people told me thank you, and, uh, and uh, there was little doubt that, that people appreciated uh, what we were doing. And it wasn't me, of course. It was the team down there. And uh, I thought every time I went to Home Depot or the shopping center or anyplace else, I uh, saw a lot of people that uh, they always they recognize you, and, and they, uh, uh, they really loved us there. And I don't mean me again, I mean the team. They love having the Hurricane Center yeah. there in that area. And all up and down the East Coast, people recognize you. Right. You had such a calm way about yourself. I, I, I can't put it into words compared to some of the other uh, directors that have been down there, but you just have a calmness about yourself that's so likable. And I know that the people I've talked to, they've mentioned that you're their favorite director that's... Uh, been the director of the Hurricane Center because of the, the calmness and the, you come across as such a polite, kind person, even no matter how much pressure you're under, and uh, we really appreciated that. Well, I, was, I was putting on a good face, I guess, because it was not always calm there. <laughs> there were kind of hectic, hectic times. Well, oh, now uh, you're involved with the Early Alert program right. uh, that right. William is running, right. and uh, for those of you that are wondering about that, is there's a link at the upper, upper left-hand corner of Hurricane City. It's called Early Alert, and this is an email service. There's a subscription service which has all the details of what's going on with the hurricane. There's uh, satellite imagery. There's uh, track projections if a hurricane is threatening. Uh, there's, of course, the uh, forecast advisories and the discussions and stuff like that. And they also, what I like is they send an email that has the uh, actual projections from month to month of what, what the high-risk areas are. And uh, Jerry is involved in that as well, and he'll give his opinion once in a while in, in some of the emails that are sent on the subscription list. Uh, there is also a free subscription as well to the service, uh, but I, I don't think you are – participating in the free version is that right jerry uh that's right uh well sometimes i'll help write those up but uh, but for the most part those are pretty much automated okay and uh, anybody that's interested in those emails um is uh there's a link in the upper left hand corner click on that just uh put your email address in there fill the form out and uh, they will get you on the list and you'll be able to get all the uh, information from early alerts about hurricanes out there and we appreciate the hard work you guys are doing on that yeah that's, that's kind of a fun thing if there's anything we've been criticized for it's being too cheap so uh that we, we don't charge enough so uh uh i might think about subscribing at uh uh, even for a, a person with a family, it's uh, dirt cheap, and uh, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's a huge bargain, but uh, you ought to look at it. And it also targets the area that you live in, too. If you have a business, uh, it will target the area that you live in. If you're in Miami, it'll give Miami specific information and uh uh, just give it a give it a look. Uh, the link in the upper left hand corner, and uh, they have a subscription service and the free service, which uh, have two different options uh, for information you get in your email box. Um, and uh, you guys, how long have you been doing that now? Uh, this, I believe, is our third year. Third year, okay. The first year we probably uh, didn't have more than half a dozen customers, but we're running a few hundred customers now, and uh, it's beginning to take off. Well, that's that's good to hear, and uh, um, I know I use it, and I, I enjoy getting those emails in, and they, they do have some interesting graphics and uh, some interesting stuff about that you can't get anywhere else on the Internet, folks. Uh, you can get the – there are services out there that give you advisories and stuff, but not all the additional things that this has, so it's it's well worth it. But uh, Now, Jerry, are you going to stay out in California, or, uh, or is this a temporary residence? We uh, live half the year in Florida. We live in central Florida, we, uh, Polk City, uh, halfway between Tampa and Orlando. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we live down there in the wintertime, uh, as, as you might guess, although people think you're crazy if you go from this part of we're in central California. If you go from, you know, there's no such thing as a snowbird because we don't see snow here. 
but uh, we're uh, we're called laughing like snowbirds. But you're not here during the hurricane season. No, no. Uh, just because uh, it's uh, uh, miserably warm there, for my taste, in the middle of the summer. Mm-hmm. You can go up to Upper Michigan right now. It's <laughs> they're they're looking at uh, winter weather warnings. It'd be like completely different, like day to night in Florida to up there right now. Well, uh, those, those are my Florida neighbors that moved down here and join us in the winter. Well, we're supposed to see 40s Friday morning here in northeast Florida. Oh, 40s out here where I live, so. Well, that's, uh, that's about the way our temperatures have been out here. We, we've, been, we've been in the high 30s and low 40s, uh, right. most low temperatures for the last week or two. You're not afraid of earthquakes out there? Uh, I'm always afraid of earthquakes, but uh, uh, you got to live somewhere. I haven't seen anybody move away because of earthquakes. Yeah, it's a rarity. We, I got a question for you. We asked Dr. Sheets back in August when he was on the show. Um, what is the what hurricane was most memorable for you? Well, of course, have to be Andrew because I was there. But let's put Andrew aside, and then it's probably Mitch. Uh, Mitch that didn't strike the United States except as a tropical storm after, but uh, that may have killed 10,000 people down in uh, Honduras and Nicaragua. And, uh, boy, there was a lot of soul-searching over that one to see if we could have done anything better. Mm -hmm. Models just failed us. Um, It was a Category 5 hurricane out there. And uh, everybody was watching it when it was a Category 5, and then it started weakening. And as it started weakening, it was causing extreme rains over the mountains of Nicaragua and, uh, and Honduras. And uh, those rains uh, just brought floods and uh, wiped out whole villages. And uh, it was just an awful thing. And, uh, and the Phantom... Yeah, they sunk a little ship down there, a little uh, sailing vessel, the Phantom. Have you, you read, read that book? book? Uh, yeah, I, I, I read that book. It was uh, really fascinating, uh, the way they uh, battled that hurricane. And, uh, uh-huh. you know, we'll not, I guess we'll never know the final minutes of what happened to that ship. But um, I know that the owner of the, the uh, Barefoot, is it Barefoot Cruises or something like that? Yeah, it's something like that. I was trying to think of the name of the guy that wrote the book, but I can't think of that. Uh, Jim Carrier. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I thought it was a, a very good hurricane book. It's probably one of the better ones I've read. I did, too. I proofed that for him uh, before <laughs> it was sent out and, and uh, wrote a, a nice little endorsement for it. I thought it was fantastic. I, I really enjoyed it every minute of it. Yeah, and they got pictures of the crew in there. It's really a neat book. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, Boy, what heroes? I mean, he's. I mean, I, I want to say, I don't want to say heroes. Uh, not that they had a choice in the matter, but uh, could you imagine what they had to go through in those final uh, hours out there with uh, 40, 60 foot waves pounding them? Uh, uh, I, what do you think uh, happened? Do you think this ship just snapped in half, or? It's hard to say. Uh, you know, it could capsize or just uh, come apart. Uh lots of things can happen it could have run aground there are places it could have run aground and then sunk and you still wouldn't find you wouldn't find anything they found very little wreckage from it <laughs> but uh, uh, lots of lots of things that's the uh, kind of a vessel that you do not want to be in a hurricane in mm-hmm. well luckily they dropped off the passengers before they set sail right and had they stayed there and this was 2020 hindsight had mm-hmm. they stayed there they would have had absolutely no effect at all. A little, little bit of surf, probably, but uh, no effect. Yeah. So that's the part where bad forecasts uh, come in. Did you get, um, did they, the owner of the company, uh, did you talk to him at all after that? No, we were talking to them uh, during the event, and uh, uh, our uh, reconnaissance guys were, uh, were trying to spot the, the vessel. They, from time to time, do that. They will take on a, uh, a, a, by the way, search and rescue mission when they're in there. 
but uh, they never saw it. <clears throat> tragic. It's a tragic story. Well, uh, Bob, do you have any more questions for Jerry? Uh, no, not off the bat. I'm, you kind of caught me off guard there with him calling in. <laughs> well, that's probably just as well. Uh, just, uh, this I would have been more prepared if I knew you were going to be calling in. Um, I, it, 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 you know, you mentioned earlier about not knowing what hurricane winds can do to high rises. In 1979, when Hurricane David passed by South Florida, I knew some people that lived in condominiums there in the Sunny Isles area there on, on Miami Beach there in North Dade County. And they had their, some of the windows there in the Point East condominiums in Admiral's Port were blown out. And think that um, minimal hurricane passing offshore could do that. I think we would pretty much know what would happen if a major hurricane was to make landfall or there were high rises. Um, saw Camille, some of the pictures I saw of Camille, where the things, where the shell, there were just shells, even with Opal, where there were just shells of just the concrete walls and slabs were left. Mm -hmm. That's because I, I watched a lot of those condominiums go up there north, northern Dade, Dade County, the Aventura area and everything. And other than just the walls and the floors and ceilings, everything in between is uh, just drywall. Hurricane, you know, except for, you know, in porch areas, or they put up the stud coat. But I believe with the, with the building codes, a lot of that's changed, but we still have some, a lot of the older... Yeah, a lot of the older construction down there. Well, you know, and that probably goes to say same for the rest of the coastal areas. Well, you know, you speaking of the '70s, um, got an email from Diane again. She said her ex-husband worked for a company in the early '70s. Uh, they were a foundation building company. They put the foundations underneath the condos, and they said all the company did literally was pack the sand tightly. Then the condos went up on the site. Both he and his father worked there. And they both swore that from the time, that time on they would not be caught dead living in a condominium. And uh, she said that uh, the sand foundation story is for real, that they were not using proper foundations underneath those condos. That's a scary thought. Yeah, it is. Uh, I don't think I had heard that before. I had heard that, that the, uh, the filings were, uh, were uh, a sham, but not that there, that there weren't filings. Uh, that's a that's a different story. Wow. Yeah, I hope that's. I, I mean, I guess it's true. She doesn't seem like she'd make a story up like that. But if that's the case, uh, boy, that's a scary thought. If uh, we have a direct hit from a major hurricane, it's going to be some problems. Yeah. Jerry, well, that may that may be one thing that, that uh, uh, maybe should point out that that the uh, earthquake building standards are good and they're adhered to. I bought this house here that I'm living in about uh, four or five years ago, and you would not believe the, the things that they have in it to uh, to make it uh, earthquake proof. And I suspect it will it will survive, but they look like they're much better built than most of our homes in South Florida. You know, Jerry, I hear comparisons to up north. You know, people from up north come down and they say the buildings are crappy down here. And my response is, well, you really haven't been tested up there with an Andrew type of a storm or a Hugo uh, up in uh, New Jersey and Delaware and mm -hmm. areas like that. And I'm, I'm wondering if that's really the case, the buildings are better, if it's, or if it's just because they haven't simply haven't been hit dead on by a, uh, a Category 4 or 5 hurricane. It is garbage. Uh, I have two brother-in-laws that are in the building industry, one in Virginia and one in North Carolina. And they tell me that the building construction is a sham, that it's, uh, it's outrageous. That, uh, and, and this is not just them, but we've been hearing this for years, that, uh, that uh, buildings are, uh, are not hurricane-proof by any stretch of the imagination in most of the East Coast. So what, what is, appears to most people is that homes are built to be warmer up there, and they probably have more insulation. They seem more solid, 
but uh, when you get right down to it, the roof goes away, and uh, uh, they don't have the, the, what we would consider to be a bare minimum of hurricane clips, that sort of thing, to, to tie the roof uh, uh, through clips to the foundation and uh, or the slab. And uh, there, I, I think you you probably have this. Uh, although we probably don't have the enforcement that we ought to, you probably have the best building code anywhere in South Florida. It's always under attack, by the way. Yeah. So, in other words, you think if New Jersey gets hit by a Category Four, we could see similar damage to an Andrew type situation? Yes, except that. But uh, a Category 4 is very unlikely up that far. Yep. Uh, and so they do have that going for them. Now, they probably don't, they probably shouldn't have the same building code as South Florida, but they probably ought to have a better building code than they've got. And I don't want to single out New Jersey because I'm not, I'm not sure. I probably know less about their building code than almost any state up there. Well, Jerry, uh, we really appreciate you calling in tonight. Uh, it's currently 9 o'clock on the Barometer Bob Show for November 12th. And uh, Jerry called in unexpectedly tonight, and we really appreciate this uh, call from you. And um, hope you, you know, maybe can give us a call sometime in the future, uh, you know, just to say hello during one of these shows or during the hurricane coverage or something and give us a little spin on what you think is happening. And uh, that would be much appreciated. Okay. I was I enjoyed it. Uh, Thanks, have, Jerry. have a good evening, gentlemen. All right, you, you take too. care out there in California. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye now. Bye now. Uh, both were great directors, and uh, you know Jerry just had a way about him. I don't know how you how you felt about Jerry as a director, but I I just felt that way. You know that he was just had a. No, I I I I liked him when he was there. Um, he did thorough. He was informative, and he wasn't. Um, he was there for us, you know, that that was the thing, like like uh Dr. Sheets was there and like Max is there and um the one person out of the whole list over the years who wasn't there for the people was Bob Burpee. He always had someone else doing the updates. I, I think I'd seen him once do a uh, update when something was out there, you know. 